Often, viewers are left dumbfounded by the actions and choices made by characters in movies. Just because the situation is fictional doesn't mean characters should suddenly lose all common sense, right? And so it's immensely rewarding when we do see characters actually using their noggins and giving us a rest from yelling at the screen. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie, teaming up with Jess, Till, Ewan and Jules to give you the 65 smartest decisions in movie history. The faked suicide in Halloween ends. Halloween Ends was nothing if not opinion splitting when it sliced its way to the silver screen last year. But one of the things most viewers could agree on was that Laurie Strode was positioned as extremely smart. Granted, the biggest gripe about Halloween Ends is that it features such minimal Laurie versus Michael Myers action, with Rowan Campbell's Corey Cunningham taking centre stage on the villain front, but the way in which Strode tricks Corey was fantastically done. To be fair, this whole situation tricked a fair few moviegoers upon a first watch, with Jamie Lee Curtis's iconic character seemingly at such a low point that she was about to take her own life. And Laurie even called 911 to report her impending suicide before putting a gun to her head. So when we hear a gunshot and see a splatter of something, it's easy to see why the lurking Corey would presume Laurie had shot herself. Only she hadn't, and instead it was Cunningham who was soon shot by the wily veteran. Luke throws his lightsaber away, Return of the Jedi. Nailing down just one scene as Star Wars' is best is a tricky task, but one that must surely be in the running has to be Luke Skywalker's final confrontation with Darth Vader and the Emperor in Episode 6. It's a wonderful duel, and it's also unlike any other in the franchise in that it's one you don't want Luke to win. Both he and his father are being manipulated by the Emperor, and there's a wonderfully haunting John Williams composition that adds to the unease of seeing father and son fight to the death. The duel ends once Luke fully taps into the dark side and unleashes his anger on his father, but he realises his mistake once the Emperor begins to goad him into executing him. In that moment, Luke throws away his lightsaber, affirming once again that he is a Jedi Knight, just like his father, and willingly suffers Palpatine's attacks to galvanize Vader into finally embracing the light side he'd avoided for so long. Had Luke resisted the Emperor with force, he would have likely ended up like an overcooked Womprat on Tatooine. It's only with Vader's unexpected betrayal that Darth Sidious is confined to the second Death Star's reactor, and it's Luke's strength and courage that inspires him. Irradiating Fort Knox's gold in Goldfinger In Goldfinger, James Bond learns that a German tycoon called Auric Goldfinger aims to break into Fort Knox. Assuming that he plans to steal the vault's gold, Bond confronts the maniacal mogul and explains that his scheme won't work. Because there is nearly 13,000 tons of gold in the facility, there's no way Goldfinger could steal it all before the army intervened. But Goldfinger isn't going to steal the gold, he's going to irradiate it. His plan is to set off a dirty bomb in Fort Knox, making billions of dollars worth of gold inert for half a century. This would cause Goldfinger's own gold to skyrocket while the economy collapses. Even though most Bond villain plans are fantastical, this one is theoretically possible. In fact, an economist for the World Bank stated that Goldfinger's scheme is pretty solid. What's really interesting is that Goldfinger was intending to steal the gold in the novel and the original script. When the filmmakers realised the logistics of such a crime would be impossible, they altered Goldfinger's plan to make it more realistic. Mr. Glass's supervillain plan is a massive red herring, Glass. M. Night Shyamalan's latest effort may have received mixed reviews and ended in a rather confusing and altogether disappointing way, but it did manage to deliver one truly brilliant piece of subversion in the final, final moments. Here, Mr. Glass seemingly sets the stage for a totally typical final superhero showdown between the Horde and the Overseer that's going to take place at Osaka Tower, a giant skyscraper about to be completed and unveiled to the public. Both the audience and Dunn are duped into believing the same lie, that Glass will use the media presence there to expose the existence of superpowered people on Earth, when in fact he's been playing 4D chess and has a whole other plan in mind. As we know by now, the scrum doesn't actually happen there, but in a parking lot of the psychiatric facility where they're all being held, all because a secret government force is preempting their escape and are trying to hide their existence. But wait, there's a big twist that happens after we've said goodbye to the main cast in the form of Mr. Glass's final plan. As it turns out, Glass had previously hacked the mental institution's security system in order to stream the battle between the Horde and Dunn to his own network, which is then set up to forward to his mother, the Horde's surviving victim Casey, and Dunn's son, Joseph. 
The film consequently ends with the three releasing the footage online for the world to see, ensuring that Mr. Glass's plan was carried out exactly as he intended. It's a clever moment that while being marred by stumpy storytelling, is still an excellent plan on paper. Using the orange tutsia in Prey after several bland to bad offerings in the franchise, 2022's Prey was a great return to form for an IP which first impressed audiences back in 1987 with the Arnold Schwarzenegger-fronted Predator. Far from the big beefy boys with big beefy guns approach of that original movie though, Prey is an incredibly stripped back affair that drops the titular Yatua species into 1700s Great Northern Plains. With Comanche warrior Nauru at the core of this tale, she is one of several who have run-ins with the film's sole alien hunter. Unlike the vast majority of the other characters in Prey Mind, Nauru not only survives this encounter, but she actually manages to kill and behead the beast. To do that, she realises that the Yatua relies on body heat to detect movement and kill its target. This is where the orange totsia, an orange flower, comes in handy, as ingesting this plant or rubbing it on your body naturally lowers a person's temperature. Upon utilising this herb, Nauru effectively levels the playing field for Prey's final battle, and if anything, her knowledge of her surroundings gives her an advantage over her opponent. As such, this badass is able to get the better of the intergalactic brute and eventually fatally turn its own weapon against the creature. Obeying the rules, zombie land. When people think of the rules of horror, minds usually tend to wander to the speech delivered by Jamie Kennedy's Randy in the first Scream movie. No sex, no drink or drugs, and no I'll be right backs. The point being, the rules of the genre were changing back in 96. Keeping on top of the rules of the day are always a good idea though, and that was a concept that was front and centre to any and all success achieved by the characters at the core of Zombieland. Ruben Fleischer's 2009 picture is a firm favourite for those with a penchant for the undead, and it's a tale that so often rewards those characters smart enough to obey the rules clearly lined out in Zombieland. Rules such as working on your cardio to outrun zombies, always double tap to make sure someone is really dead, be wary of bathrooms, don't get caught with your pants down, and always use seatbelts because zombies don't, all work wonders for those willing to listen to the rules on the table. For those not smart enough to abide by these rules, of course, a gnarly death is usually lurking around the corner just for them. Maul kills Qui-Gon Jinn, the Phantom Menace. Chalk this up to being more a happy accident than a conscious decision to alter the course of the galaxy, but there's no denying killing Qui-Gon was the smartest thing Palpatine himself probably doesn't even realise he accomplished. Clone Wars producer Dave Filoni has previously spoken at length about how Duel of the Fates is secretly Star Wars' most important scene back in 2020, and the evidence, now of course backed up by expanded material from the books and animated shows, more than lends itself to his reasoning. Qui-Gon Jinn is essentially the only Jedi who sees where the Order is heading at the time of the Phantom Menace. He's also a bit of a maverick, a scholar with a true reverence for the Force and a curiosity for prophecy first stoked by his master Count Dooku decades earlier. Perhaps more important, however, are Qui-Gon's fatherly qualities. He's the father figure Anakin desires and would have happily trained him away from the Jedi had they refused. Qui-Gon's death seals Anakin's fate though. He's trained by Obi-Wan, who's less a father and more a brother, and is isolated by Palpatine, who exploits the Jedi Order's secrecy to his own benefit. Had Qui-Gon lived, there's a solid chance that Anakin may never have turned. Doctor Strange traps Dormammu in a time loop. Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange has been a bastion of smart decisions throughout his time as a superhero. Though him giving up the Time Stone to Thanos in Avengers Infinity War was a masterful feat of long-term strategy, his plan to defeat interdimensional entity Dormammu was just as creative. In order to stop villainous zealots from bringing the Dark Dimension to Earth and effectively destroying it, Doctor Strange heads to the Dark Dimension to confront Dormammu himself. Strange claims that he's there to bargain, when in reality he's used the Eye of Agamotto to trap both himself and Dormammu within a time loop. And so when Dormammu inevitably kills Strange, the cycle simply begins again, and Dormammu soon realises that he can't kill Strange in order to escape the cycle. He needs to give him what he wants. Dormammu eventually agrees to leave Earth alone and recalls the zealots back to his dimension, proving that if you want to get someone to do something for you, the most effective way is to annoy the living hell out of them and until they do it. Brilliant message. Taking matters into her own hands, Maggie. Few zombie movies are quite as heartbreaking as Maggie. 
again offering something rather different to the norm of the undead being sliced and splattered for 90 minutes. Mackie serves as somewhat of a minimalist character study on what somebody goes through in the days and weeks after being bitten by a zombie. Setting the table for the film, Abigail Breslin plays the titular Maggie, a young girl who is in the process of slowly turning into a flesh-craving zombie. Alongside her, we have Arnold Schwarzenegger in the most poignant role of his career as Maggie's widowed father. Managing to convince the authorities to let Maggie remain at home rather than be quarantined until her inevitable turn, Arnold's character Wade accepts the heartbreaking reality that he himself will have to take on the responsibility of eventually killing his own beloved daughter in exchange for her to be allowed to see her final days out at the family home. Rarely has a zombie movie been so emotional, as we see both Wade and Maggie struggle with their own inevitability. While it wasn't a wise decision that necessarily saved the day so that all could live happily ever after, a decreasingly human Maggie manages to muster up enough self-control to give her sleeping father one last kiss before throwing herself off of her roof and to her death, saving her troubled father from having to do something that he would never, ever recover from. Tricking the raptor with a reflection, Jurassic Park. Though everyone loves to complain about the kid characters in the Jurassic Park movies, in Steven Spielberg's classic original, a child is actually responsible for one of the series' smartest defensive maneuvers against a bloodthirsty dinosaur. In the film's bloody intense kitchen sequence, Lex bangs a ladle on the floor to draw the raptor's attention away from her understandably terrified brother, Tim. One of the raptors takes the bait and starts stalking Lex, who has climbed inside one of the kitchen's metal cabinets. When the dino makes a beeline for her face, though, it has a rude awakening as it meets nothing but cold, shiny metal. As it turns out, Lex was actually inside an opposite cabinet and used its reflection to trick the dinosaur, allowing herself and her brother to scarcely make their escape. For a child who should for all intents and purposes have been a gibbering wreck, that was some mighty fine thinking on her feet. Playing possum in Jason Goes to Hell. The opening scene to Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, starts in gloriously generic fashion. We first see a typical disposable and needlessly naked, of course, young adult in a classic Cabin in the Woods setting. Wouldn't you know it, but this vulnerable woman soon finds herself being stalked by Jason Voorhees. Quicker than you can say, grab a towel and run for your life, this poor, poor victim is stranded in the middle of the woods and has the hulking frame of Jason towering over her. The thing is, this was all actually part of the cunning ruse to lure Jason to his ultimate demise. While Jason Goes to Hell is a painful film to watch at times, credit has to at least be given for the picture's refreshingly different opening act. You see, that disposable young adult is really an undercover FBI agent designed to draw Jason out into an open part of the woods where a tooled up SWAT team are waiting to blow Voorhees to smithereens. Despite the plan to literally blow Jason up working so well, what the SWAT team and disgruntled audiences didn't fathom in is that this would lead to a movie where the turd-looking spirit of Jason was orally passed from person to person throughout the rest of the film, resulting in a Friday the 13th movie that had only a matter of minutes with the physical presence of Jason Voorhees on screen. Stanley's sacrifice in IT Chapter 2 while his Losers Club friends would have clearly loved to have Stanley with them for their later life battle with Pennywise in It Chapter 2, the narrative of this Stephen King adaptation is that the Losers were only able to truly stop the dancing clown once and for all because of Stanley's passing. It's extremely hard to justify someone taking their own life as being a smart decision. But the closing moments of Chapter 2 frame it as though the Losers wouldn't have had the full motivation to topple Pennywise were it not for Stan's death being a tool to fully bring them together for this battle. Once Bill Skarsgård's heinous Harlequin had been dispatched of at the end of this second picture, there's a slight jump forward in time where we see Mike receive a letter from the deceased Stanley. A letter which details how Stanley was too scared to fight it and that him sacrificing his life was essentially for the greater good. Stanley's intentions certainly worked, but it obviously remains to be seen whether Stan really needed to be so extreme in his actions in order to motivate his old school pals. We're leaving Event Horizon. Paul W.S. Anderson's criminally underrated sci-fi horror film follows a crew of astronauts searching for the missing titular spaceship, and once they locate and board it, they soon discover that a massacre has taken place as they begin to be haunted by visions of their own troubled pasts. Things reach a horrifying apex when the astronauts discover a video log of the Event Horizon's original crew brutally mutilating one another, and without missing a beat, Captain Miller tells his team 
We're leaving. Miller quickly devises a plan to destroy the Event Horizon, hilariously telling its designer, Dr. Weir, F this ship. Well, actually, he doesn't actually say F, but you get what I mean. Ultimately, Miller ends up sacrificing himself to destroy the doomed vessel because he's a badass, and his quick decision making is ultimately what allows the incident to have any survivors at all. His utter lack of hesitation in announcing what needs to be done remains not only whip smart, but also extremely satisfying. You really would just get the hell out of there. Thrawn climbs the Imperial ranks. Star Wars Thrawn. Timothy Zahn has been a big part of the Star Wars mythos for almost three decades now, and is most famous for creating Thrawn, a tactical chiss genius who ascended the ranks of the Empire to eventually assume command of the Imperial Remnant after Return of the Jedi. Thrawn was wiped from the Star Wars canon when Disney decided to reboot the expanded universe and start anew in 2014, but his popularity meant he wouldn't lay dormant for long. Thrawn made his anticipated return in the second season of Star Wars Rebels, and Zahn was tasked once again to explore the character in a series of novels set during the Age of Rebellion. The Thrawn of the new canon isn't quite the same as the one of yore, but he's still a ruthless customer and one of the more unique villains in the Star Wars mythos. He's also one of the most intelligent, and the fact he hails from the unknown reaches of the galaxy begets the kind of wisdom few others would be able to match. Thrawn's time with the Empire, at least for now, doesn't end well, as he gets sucked into the unknown regions by Ezra Bridger at the end of Rebels, but few can deny just how smart he is up until that point. He joins the Empire primarily to protect the Chiss homeworld against the threats of the unknown regions, makes himself indispensable to the Emperor, and ascends the Imperial ranks by navigating the political scene with a ruthless cunning old Sheev himself would be proud of. The Fireworks in a Quiet Place 2018's A Quiet Place is a tense, tense picture, and few scenes are quite as tense as the moment when Emily Blunt's Evelyn Abbott goes into labour. Seeing how giving birth is one of the most painful things a human body can go through, combined with the fact that A Quiet Place features a world in which murderous blind aliens kill anyone who makes even the tiniest of sounds, you can understand why the Abbots have quite the pickle here. Should Evelyn make a sound during childbirth, that will result in the death of herself and her impending new arrival. In a rather genius piece of thinking, the Abbott family had planned ahead here, with them having some fireworks hidden at a decent enough distance from their farmhouse. The clan's eldest son, Marcus, swiftly sprints out to the spot of these fireworks and sets them off as the labour begins, causing the alien creatures to be distracted by the spectacle, and also allowing Evelyn to let out some screams of pain as she gives birth in the bathtub to the family's latest addition. Helen embracing her fate in Candyman it may sound defeatist, but sometimes the smartest thing to do in a slasher movie is to embrace your fate. While 1992's Candyman saw Virginia Madsen's Helen end up having a horrible death as she was burnt to a crisp, that decision proved to be a smart one where it pertains to the greater good. For Helen, that greater good was protecting the baby son of her friend Anne-Marie. To do so, Helen ended up burning to death after finally giving in to the charming hook hand at Candyman. The Candyman implores Helen, who he believes to be the reincarnation of his former lover, to join him in his quest to strike fear into the residents of Cabrini Green, in order to maintain his legacy amongst modern-day folklore, and she finally bends to Candyman's will. It's only in doing this that Helen is able to save the life of young Anthony, even if her own fate may be not quite so much of a positive one. That said, Helen opting to give herself in to the Candyman did also have one added silver lining, as it let her become a vengeance-seeking spirit who was able to slice up her cheating ex-husband. Fair enough. Simon's plan would have worked in Die Hard with a Vengeance. In Die Hard with a Vengeance, Simon Gruber threatens to blow up a school in New York unless John McClane plays a cat and mouse game with him. Meanwhile, the FBI and the police force are desperately trying to locate which school harbors the explosive. What they don't realize is that Simon has sent them off on a wild goose chase while he breaks into the Federal Reserve Bank, which contains more wealth than any vault on Earth. Disguising his men as subway car repair workers, Simon breaks into the reserve through an aqueduct and hauls out $140 billion worth of gold in four 
14 dump trucks. After scripting this scene, the writer Jonathan Hensley was contacted by the FBI and asked how he knew the reserve's vault was beside a subway spur and could be accessed through an aqueduct tunnel. Hensley reassured the Bureau that he wasn't a criminal, but the agent he spoke to said someone could actually pull this off. He even had a meeting with other agents to strengthen the reserve's security. That's right, the FBI thought that this plan was so foolproof that they thought the writer may have been a terrorist and had to update the vault's safeguards. Sciencing the sh out of his situation, The Martian. Ridley Scott's The Martian is one of the smartest and most realistic sci-fi films of recent times, following an astronaut, Mark Watney, who ends up stranded on Mars and must science the sh out of his situation in order to survive, as he so memorably puts it. Despite the planet's hostile conditions, Watney displays frequently brilliant resourcefulness throughout the film, performing self-surgery on himself to remove debris, and being a botanist, he's able to grow potatoes using the feces of both himself and the other crew members. This gives him enough basic calories to survive being marooned, at least until the crops are destroyed in an accident, while he also soups up his rover to travel and even manages to use the Pathfinder probe to communicate with Earth. Basically, he puts almost every foot right, and with him being far more capable at surviving Mars's harsh climate than just about anybody watching, the film is almost totally free of the frustrating character decisions that cloud Scott's other aforementioned recent sci-fi movies. Making the most of your tools in The Reef Stalked to some, The Reef is the very best shark movie not named Jaws. So when a sequel, The Reef Stalked, swam its way to screens last summer, there was some hope that this second Reef picture would capture some of the nerve-shredding dread and tension of its predecessor. Unfortunately, Stort proved to be somewhat of a disappointment in that regard. Completely unrelated to The Reef, this sequel centres on sisters Nick and Annie, and their friends Jodie and Lisa, as they find themselves out in the water and uh, stalked by a great white shark. You see, this group had met up to mark the death of Nick and Annie's sibling, Kath, who was killed by her abusive husband nine months ago. By the reef stalks finale, Lisa has fallen victim to this shark and our remaining trio are stranded in a small knackered boat that's taking on water. It's here that Nick comes up with an extremely simple but extremely effective plan. Realising that the only items on the boat with them are a mesh net and a machete, Nick lures in the apex predator, throws the net over it and then eventually stabs the beast to death. Mowing down the undead. Brain dead. Peter Jackson may these days be synonymous with all things Middle-earth thanks to the success of his Lord of the Rings and Hobbit trilogies, but the filmmaker's younger days saw him playing in the horror ball pit with the likes of Bad Taste and Brain Dead. A zombie offering 1992's Brain Dead, also known as Dead or Alive in some markets, features one of the most inventive and effective methods committed to film when it comes to taking down a horde of zombies. After the undead are joined by further reanimated corpses, things look pretty grim for our gang of survivors as zombies run amok through their mansion setting. In a move that should be applauded for its sheer ingenuity, our plucky protagonist has a way of dealing with the masses of shuffling sorts who stand in his way of survival, and it's entering the mansion with a lawnmower strapped to his chest. From there, he simply strolls through the pack of zombies in front of him with the mower's blade sending limbs flying as it slices through the ghoulish creatures looking to chow down. Edna's No Capes Rule – The Incredibles Edna Mode is surely The Incredibles' most beloved supporting character, a delightfully demented fashion designer known for her work with some of the world's most famous superheroes. She truly came into her own, however, when meeting Mr. Incredible to consider a new costume design. After he insists on having a cape, Edna stubbornly insists, no capes. And it's here that we get to see one of the best critiques of the superhero genres, in that Edna showcases a ton of superheroes whose capes were actually their undoing. Not only is this morbidly hilarious, but it actually cements Edna as the smartest person in the room. Hell, she's even smarter than Syndrome, who also falls foul of his flowing fashion faux pas. Thanos wins in Avengers Infinity War before the release of Avengers Infinity War, many cinema goers unfamiliar with Thanos were worried that the Mad Titan would prove a disappointment. What does he even do? He's just sat in a chair for years. Why doesn't he get the Infinity Stones himself if he wants them so badly? But when the film was released, it was clear that Thanos' inaction was because he was waiting for the perfect moment to obtain the cosmic gems. After he knew where all but one of them were, he still couldn't make a move since the Space Stone was heavily guarded in Asgard. But the instant Asgard was destroyed, he trapped 
at the Power Stone first, knowing it would allow him to overpower anyone. He then located the Asgardian ship that housed the Space Stone and used its properties to teleport around the universe, allowing him to easily retrieve the others. Even though he had been preparing this plan for years, he attained all six stones in days and successfully wiped out half of all life in the universe with their power. The Avengers may have reversed his actions, but the ending of Infinity War proved to be the most humiliating defeat Earth's mightiest heroes had ever received. Concealing human scent, Warm Bodies Released in 2013, Warm Bodies is a relatively unique beast in the pantheon of zombie movies. Picking up seven years after the world fell victim to a zombie apocalypse, this Jonathan Levine-helmed offering largely tells its story from the perspective of a zombie named R. Played by Nicholas Holt, our main man R's particular reason for craving human brains is so he can feel more alive by experiencing the memories held within the said grey matter. When he eats the brains of Julia's boyfriend Perry, R begins to feel an attraction towards Teresa Palmer's Julia. Where the smart decision comes in here is moments after R devours Perry. Spotting Julia across the room, R realises that his fellow undead are setting their own eyes on the delicate delights of human flesh that Julia offers up. In a remarkable spark of smarts, R shuffles over to Julia and wipes some of his blood on her face, which in turn conceals her scent from the zombies who were previously sniffing her out for their next meal. Not only did this prove clever in terms of preventing Julia from being killed, it also benefited both R and Julia in the long term, as R would eventually become humans once more and he and Julia would finally act on their romantic impulses as the zombie apocalypse came crashing down around them by the film's close. Arnim Zola embeds Hydra within S.H.I.E.L.D., Captain America, the Winter Soldier. As I mentioned earlier, the MCU was hit hard by Hydra's sleeper agents, but that couldn't have taken root without the work of villainous scientist Arnim Zola. The culmination of his and other nefarious evil doers on the payroll was Project Insight, which would have used three heavily armed helicarriers to instantly annihilate 20 million people who were believed to be Hydra's political enemies around the world. With these dissenters dead, Hydra would then be able to take control of the world with relative ease. They had sleeper agents everywhere, politicians, soldiers, even your mum, although she was a different kind of sleeper agent, but she still loved the leather though, but just not quite in the same way. Zola even defied death himself by having his brain downloaded into a supercomputer. Considering that pretty much no one saw this coming and yet the event didn't feel like a cheap shock, it's pretty immense, and it's scary to think how close Zola came to getting what he wanted as well. Grabbing the hand sanitizer in Scream Keeping your hands clean is always a good habit to keep on top of, and having some hand sanitizer to hand in 2022's Scream proved to be the perfect way to take down one of that picture's deranged ghost faces. While Richie is off battling his supposed girlfriend Tara, Sid and Gail are tasked with fighting Mikey in the kitchen of the house previously owned by Stu Marker's family. With Mikey having the upper hand as she takes on these two wounded veterans of this beloved series, Prescott grabs a nearby glass jar of hand sanitizer and smashes it over the lunatic's head. After the stovetop is then conveniently turned on, Gail shoots Mikey in the face, which causes her to stumble towards the stove's flame. Due to the alcohol prevalent in the hand sanitizer, this immediately causes Mikey to be set on fire in an extremely gnarly way. Luke's final sacrifice saves the resistance, the last Jedi. Luke Skywalker's depiction in The Last Jedi is masterful and also totally in keeping with his depiction in the original trilogy. The Luke of episodes 4, 5 and 6 constantly showed flashes of fear and anger, and when faced with the prospect of another Vader prior to The Force Awakens, he shows yet another moment of vulnerability that unleashes a horrific chain of events. But Luke Skywalker isn't a beloved character because he's perfect, or at least he shouldn't be. He's clearly flawed, and yet he's also one of the finest Jedi to ever exist, and finds a way of not only honouring the way of the Jedi, but also the legend of Luke Skywalker in his final act. With the Resistance pinned down on crates and with nowhere to go, Luke arrives to save the day. But instead of facing down Kylo Ren and the rest of the First Order in a classic lightsaber duel, he finds another way of confronting them. Luke uses all his power to project a version of himself he knows will enrage Ben Solo the most, Vader's weapon drawn, and his face de-aged to resemble his appearance from the night Ben left, in order to ensure his friends can live to fight another day. Luke takes a different path and ends up committing pretty much the ultimate Jedi act, outplaying his opponent not with his skills the lightsaber, but with his personal knowledge of Ben and his understanding of what a Jedi should be. 
It's heroic, beautiful, and heartbreaking all at once, and just about the most noble sacrifice the saga has ever seen. Giving the correct answer in Silent Night, Deadly Night. Sometimes the smartest thing you can do in a horror movie is to simply tell some murderous killer whatever they want to hear. In 1984, Silent Night, Deadly Night, Billy Chapman's strict orphanage upbringing eventually results in him leading with a firm hand when it comes to punishment in later life. All of this capitulates on one Christmas Eve, when Billy, decked out as Santa Claus for his boss, snaps and goes on a murder spree. Like so many films of the time, a hefty body count is amassed in a timely fashion. Yet there's one brief moment of hesitation during Billy's bloodthirsty rampage. That hesitation comes when, after having killed the babysitter and her boyfriend, Santa Billy encounters a young girl. Taking a moment, Billy asks the girl whether she's been naughty or nice. After Cindy proclaims she's been nice, she's gifted with a bloody knife as Santa Claus goes on his way. Should she had openly admitted to being naughty, Santa would have clearly handed out the strictest punishment possible to Cindy. Showing that he'd think nothing of killing a child, it's only minutes later that we see Billy decapitate a young bully. Because bullying is clearly naughty and totally not nice. Killing himself, Looper. When it comes to time travel, movies take a lot of liberties when it comes to what the hell they're messing with to create something believable, and Looper does its best to stamp its own brand of weird sci-fi goodness across the board. Telling the story of a Looper named Joe, aka a hitman that kills targets that have been sent back in time to avoid leaving a crime scene, he's faced with the harsh reality of having to one day kill the older version of himself to close a loop of criminal activity. What he didn't expect is for his older version to not come as willingly as you would think when the time actually comes. The older Joe was travelled back in time to kill those in charge of his crime syndicate that eventually end up responsible for the death of his wife. But his actions will cause the rise of a powerful telekinetic force that threatens the system as everyone knows it. When young Joe realises his actions in the future causes a rift in his reality, in such a way that causes all of his pain and suffering, he completes his loop in the only way that's left for him, by killing himself so his older counterpart never has a chance to exist in the first place. It's a terrifically sad but poignant ending that ties together Looper's threads in excellent fashion. That is, if you can wrap your head around it all, of course. Going along with your attackers in the Utah Cabin Murders. The Utah Cabin Murders is not a good movie. That said, it does feature a life-saving decision towards the close. Based on a very real 1990 home invasion by Von Taylor and Edward Deli, this picture sees these two convicts torment a family at their remote cabin retreat. While the names of the killers are the same as the real-life counterparts, the family name has been changed to Anderson for the film. The Utah Cabin Murders sees the grandmother and mother of the Anderson family executed by these nefarious masked figures. For the father, Richard, he's shot and presumed dead, which leads to Taylor and Deli turning their attention to sisters Lanier and Tina. Unfortunately, this attention means that Taylor in particular wants to take the girls upstairs to have sex with them. Shockingly, the older of the sisters agrees to this and the siblings and their attackers head up to one of the bedrooms. Where this ultimately proves to be a wise move is that Lanier had noticed that her dad wasn't quite as dead as was believed. Getting these creeps out of that room allowed for the family patriarch to call the police who arrived in time to arrest the two men. In the real world, Von Taylor was handed the death penalty, which has continuously been challenged to this day for his actions, whereas Edward Deli received a life sentence. For Joker's plans within plans in The Dark Knight. In The Dark Knight, Joker proves his theatrical style of villainy isn't just for show. His crimes appear over the top to distract the masses from a deeper plan. After the maniacal clown gets arrested, police assume his reign of terror is finished. However, Joker allowed himself to be imprisoned to distract the cops while his goons kidnapped Rachel Dawes and District Attorney Harvey Dent and relocated them to two bomb-filled warehouses. When the explosives detonated, Rachel was killed and Harvey was left horrifically scarred. When Joker escaped, Batman managed to stop him before he committed any more atrocities. However, Bats failed again to realise that this showdown with the demented jester was a distraction. Joker alerts Batman that he encouraged Harvey to go on a killing spree earlier that day. After Batman tracks down his former friend, they fight, which indirectly leads to Dent falling to his death. Knowing it would destroy the city to learn that the respected DA was manipulated to commit murder, Batman takes the fall for the killings, turning him into a pariah. Joker may have failed to make Batman break his one rule, but he manipulated Dent so well that it forced the Cape Crusader to retire for eight years. 
Palpatine forces Padme to go on the run. Attack of the Clones. You could just about fill this list up with all the crafty moves Sheath Palpatine makes over the course of the prequels, but his plans in Episode 2 are by far the craftiest, even if the film struggles to relay them in a compelling way. First, you have the elaborate clone army conspiracy involving a dead Jedi and a Mandalorian bounty hunter, and then you have the assassination plot against Padme Amidala. Whether Palpatine planned to have Padme killed or just taken out of the picture doesn't really matter, but the important thing is that he understands her influence in the Senate and how she can't be as easily manipulated as the other senators or even the Jedi Council. By forcing her into hiding, Padme loses the ability to vote on the Senate and nominates Jar Jar Binks as her replacement. Placements. Jar Jar isn't the wisest, and Palpatine is able to use that to his advantage, manufacturing a crisis to necessitate a standing army, and planting the idea in Jar Jar's head that he needs emergency powers to defend the Republic. And it works. In one fell swoop, Palpatine gets the war he wants, the power he craves, and the means in the Jedi's complete destruction. He also benefits from Padme's survival, as it not only leads to Anakin discovering the fate of his mother on Tatooine, but a romance that would further isolate him from the Jedi Order. Hello! 28 Days Later Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later is a really smart zombie film. Released back in 2002, this was a picture that helped to reinvent the zombie movie. Rather than shuffling, groaning on dead folks, 28 Days Later served up bloody fast and bloody terrifying infected beasts who are unlike anything film fans had ever seen before. Not only was this a smart choice to make by director Boyle and screenwriter Alex Garland, who would later go on to direct Ex Machina, but the central protagonists of 28 Days Later were likewise presented as not just your average dunderheads. As the film comes to a close, with Killian Murphy's Jim, Naomi Harris's Selina, and Megan Burns's Hannah having escaped to the sanctuary of a Cumbrian cottage, the trio have the brilliant idea of sewing giant letters spelling out hello. Not necessarily your usual cry for help, but this was more of a way to make any passing aircraft aware of their location and survival. Vision picks up Mjolnir, Avengers Age of Ultron. When Vision first arrives on the scene, it's not without warrant that the Avengers view him with hostility and suspicion. Hell, even when he's trying his best to motivate them to defeat Ultron, he's almost ignored. Well, he's ignored, that is, until he casually picks up Thor's hammer Mjolnir mid-conversation. This seemingly simple act, for Vision at least, cut through all of the Avengers' fear about his intentions, confirming his worthiness and good nature by his ability to wield Mjolnir alone. And from a storytelling perspective, it was a brilliantly elegant way for Joss Whedon to move the plot along quickly and unite the team. Nancy turning her back on Freddy, a nightmare on Elm Street. You could argue that the smartest decision surrounding A Nightmare on Elm Street was actually New Line Cinema's decision to produce the picture in the first place. At that point in time, New Line was largely a distribution house rather than a studio that developed films. Taking a chance on producing Wes Craven's 1984 A Nightmare on Elm Street, that decision proved to be so smart that the studio was given the nickname of the house that Freddy built, with that debut Elm Street offering proving to be a huge hit. To look more closely at the narrative of A Nightmare on Elm Street, though, the prime smarts on show are those of Nancy Thompson. Firstly, Nancy has the wherewithal to bring Freddy Krueger's trademark fedora hat out of her dream and into the real world. Secondly, Nancy wisely booby traps her home ahead of a plan to bring Freddy out of her dream and into the real world. The smartest decision of all, well, that would be Nancy in the film's final battle, opting to simply turn her back on Robert Englund's Krueger. Having realized that Freddy thrives on fear, Nancy ignoring him renders him powerless, and thus the creepy bastard vanishes into thin air. Giving the T-1000 the wrong dog's name, Terminator 2 Judgment Day Terminator 2 may be a film about time-traveling robots murdering the crap out of one another, but it's also one of the most smartly written sci-fi films ever made. There's subtle yet brilliant proof of that shortly after the benevolent T-800 acquires John Connor and John insists on calling to check that his foster parents haven't been harmed. But of course, John realizes something is up when his foster mother is uncharacteristically warm on the phone and the T-800 is tipped off by the sound of John's dog Max barking. The T-800 then takes the phone, mimicking John's voice as he asks his mother what's wrong with Wolfie. John's mother, having been a 
is simulated by the T-1000 doesn't know the dog's real name is Max and so goes along with it, giving them all the evidence they need that everything is not okay in House Connor. With a hilarious bluntness, the T-800 then hangs up and tells John that his foster parents are dead, as we then cut to that brilliantly gratuitous shot of the dad impaled against the wall by the T-1000's metal arm. Ahsoka tries to save the clones, the Clone Wars. Revenge of the Sith didn't devote much time to unpacking the nitty gritty details of how Order 66 worked, but thankfully the Clone Wars did. CT5555, or Fives as he's lovingly known, manages to uncover the conspiracy behind Order 66 in the Clone Wars' sixth season, after one of his comrades unwittingly executes the Order prematurely, and realises that every clone has a chip installed in their brain that will activate when given the command. Fives dies before he can expose the conspiracy because Fox, oh my god I hate you Fox, but Ahsoka uses his research to free Captain Rex from his programming in the series' final arc. The important thing here though is that Ahsoka's first instinct isn't to massacre her own troops. Instead, she endeavours to figure out what happened and tries to save as many of them as possible. A stark contrast to the way Yoda and Obi-Wan behave in Episode 3, and a prime example of how Ahsoka was able to chart her own path away from the Order after she left. Refusing the Cenobite's gift in Hellraiser Throughout the vast Hellraiser franchise, there are so many characters who have fallen afoul of the series Cenobites and been swayed by their charms and promises. One such person who you cannot say that about, though, is Riley McKendry of the most recent Hellraiser outing. A recovering drug addict, Riley's life is thrown upside down when she stumbles across the Lament Configuration puzzle box. After initially solving this puzzle, chaos, carnage and twisted imagery ensues for the character. And on that front, the biggest shock to Riley is the death of her brother Matt as part of the Cenobite's lust for pain, pleasure and general sacrifice. By Hellraiser's closing moments, Riley has played a part in helping the Cenobites fill their required sacrifices, and thus she is offered a gift by their sinister swords. That gift? Why, it's for Matt to be resurrected. Despite the obvious emotional pull that's there to bring her brother back to life, Riley ultimately decides against doing so. While she now has to deal with the grief and loss of her sibling, this character is one who is wise enough to realise that accepting a gift from the Cenobites will eventually come back to bite her on the backside down the line. Sauron's failsafe in The Lord of the Rings most villains' downfall stems from the fact that they overestimate themselves. Even though criminal masterminds like Kingpin and the Joker are defeated time and time again, they always assume their next crime spree will succeed. They rarely consider the possibility that they are destined to fail. But one person who didn't suffer from this trope was the antagonist of The Lord of the Rings, Sauron. Because he led the largest army in Middle-earth and harboured the One Ring, the ruler of Mordor was the strongest being in existence. Despite his vast power though, Sauron wasn't arrogant enough to believe his plans could not end with failure. In the event of his death, the Dark Lord placed a failsafe on the One Ring so his soul would transfer to it. Despite the fact the ring could be destroyed in the fires of Mount Doom where it was forged, Sauron poured his dark magic into it so the wielder would be compelled to protect it under any circumstances. Even after his body was destroyed, this backup plan allowed Sauron to cheat death for 2,500 years. Head for the slaughterhouse in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Most people balk at the idea of putting a new spin on an old classic and the rehashing of old ideas being one of Hollywood's greatest cruxes in recent times. Originality and new ideas are out the window, they say, and what was once old is now new again. Despite a large portion of remakes being admittedly either A, pointless, or B, goddamn awful, one of the better remakes out there is Marcus Nispel's 2003 The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. On the smarts front, it's Jessica Biel's Aaron that gets kudos here. After being put through the usual torture and torment associated with the Sawyer family, Aaron is running for her life as the bounding figure of Leatherface closes in on her. In a move that proved to be the game-changing moment in Aaron's battle for her life, she decides to take up residence in a locker in the Sawyer clan slaughterhouse. Presumably, this resting place was simply chosen because it was the nearest place available when a chainsaw-wielding maniac is on your tail. But the happenstance of this safeguard locale was that Leatherface was unable to find Eren, especially thanks to a timely pig that happened to get in Leatherface's viewpoint. Thanks to that pig distracting old Leatherface, it gave Eren the chance to launch a surprise meat cleaver attack on her hulking opponent and lop off one of his arms before making her big fist-pumping escape to freedom. Nuke the entire site from orbit and fighting the alien queen with a cargo loader, aliens. 
Ellen Ripley might just be the most consistently smart and cool-headed character in all of sci-fi cinema, honestly. Whilst it's common for movie heroes to get dumber in sequels, Ripley actually seems to grow more of a brain in James Cameron's sequel, Aliens. When Ripley and the Marines are discussing how to deal with the xenomorph infestation on Acheron, Ripley suggests they take off and nuke the entire site from orbit in order to guarantee the alien's extermination. Though Ripley's plan is sadly never executed, despite plenty of enthusiasm from the Marines, it's incredibly refreshing to hear a character cut through the crap and offer up the cleanest and most logical solution possible. If that's not smart enough, Ripley also pulls off the ingenious feat of battling the Xenomorph Queen at the end of the movie by using a cargo loader, allowing her to match its strength while also ensuring that its dangerous inner jaw can't get within snapping distance of her face. And that is just one of many reasons why Ripley remains the all-timer emblem of the strong female character, even earning Weaver a Best Actress Oscar nomination for her efforts. Mystique fills Magneto's security guard with iron. X2 X-Men United The second X-Men movie sees metal manipulating supervillain Magneto sealed inside a plastic prison, where he's totally incapable of using his abilities to effect his escape. But of course, he's a man with a plan, and this plan involves getting Mystique to hit on his security guard at a bar, after which she spikes the guard's drink and injects him with an iron solution. As a result, when the guard enters Magneto's cell the next day, Magneto is able to sense the iron and use his powers to forcibly rip it from the guard's body, forming ball bearings which he then uses to shatter the plastic prison and escape. This is a shiny example of a supervillain using their noggin to take into account all the possible factors, the specific conditions of his imprisonment and how to exploit the real flaw in any security system, the easily compromised human element. Forever prepared, Curse of Chucky. In a real world sense, it had been 22 years since audiences had seen Andy Barclay in the Child's Play franchise and 23 years since Alex Vincent was in the Andy role, so it was a welcome surprise to see Andy turn up in the closing scene of 2013's Curse of Chucky. Initially pegged as a reboot, Curse of Chucky actually ended up being both a reboot and a sequel, with the Don Mancini helmed picture showcasing that there was still plenty of life in the famed good guy doll. While it's Nika who spends the majority of Curse being tormented by Chucky, the particularly smart decision of the movie comes in the film's final few moments. It's here that franchise fans got the fist-pumping moment of seeing Alex Vincent's Andy featured, as Andy has a parcel delivered at his door. After bringing said parcel into his abode, Alex ends up on the phone to his mother, seemingly unaware that Chucky has risen from his parcel in the backdrop of Andy's phone call. The big twist here, though, is that Andy Barclay has been smart enough to be prepared for Chucky to reappear in his life for the past 20-plus years. Thus, Chucky's met with a shotgun-toting Andy, who shoots him right between his eyes. Agreeing to try again in The Invisible Man. Writer-director Lee Wanelli dived into reimagining H.G. Wells' 1987 tale for a new Invisible Man movie, which explored domestic abuse, gaslighting, and provided numerous terrifying sequences. Here, a phenomenal Elizabeth Moss plays Cecilia Cass, a woman stuck in an abusive relationship with wealthy engineering genius Adrian Griffin. After Adrian commits suicide and leaves C $5 million, she starts to experience strange occurrences from an unseen presence. An unseen presence that is the totally not-dead Adrian in an invisible suit. Skipping ahead past Adrian framing Cecilia for several murders, her being committed to a psychiatric ward and then Adrian being found held captive after his brother Tom was shot dead for being the invisible man, C put a masterful plan in place. Pregnant with Adrian's child, Cecilia is well aware that Tom was likewise set up by his own sibling, and so she agrees to give her relationship with Adrian one more try, solely so that she can wear a police wire and get a confession out of him. When Moss's character heads to the bathroom, Adrian slits his own throat, which is recorded on the house's CCTV, not to mention the police wire picks up Cecilia's screams and subsequent 911 call once she returns to the room. In actuality, C has donned an invisible suit as part of her bathroom break, and she then forced her tormentor to draw a steak knife across his throat. Staying silent, you're next. Your next is one of the great modern day slasher movies, with Shani Vincent's turn as badass survivalist Erin a standout of the horror genre. Having grown up in a compound setting where she had to learn essential survival skills, Erin was quick to rely on these instincts when she finds herself in the middle of a home invasion, featuring a group of killers in animal masks. Thanks to these skills and her own instincts, Erin was able to overcome the odds and make it out of Adam Wingard's 2011 picture in one piece. 
When it comes to one particularly smart decision from Aaron, that would be how she opted to stay quiet when answering the phone. With the cat out of the bag that the killers had been hired by Felix and his partner Z as part of a plan to have an inheritance head their way, Aaron ends up killing Felix via a blender and then stabs Z to death. It's then that Felix's cell phone rings and Aaron opts to pick up the call. Giving him enough rope to hang himself with, Aaron's silence sees her partner Crispian on the other end of the call as he reveals that he was also in on this murder spree. Which puts all of the puzzle pieces together for Aaron. Han shoots first, Star Wars A New Hope. One of the most famous moments from the original Star Wars gives fans the definitive introduction to the character of Han Solo, confirming his utter ruthlessness and saying more than reams of expository dialogue ever could. As Han prepares to leave the Mos Eisley Cantina, he's confronted by bounty hunter Greedo, who threatens Han at the behest of his boss Jabba the Hutt, to whom Han owes money. But after a brief and tense exchange, Han calmly pulls his blaster and shoots Greedo dead without a second thought. It's a perfect distillation of Han as a character, cementing his quick thinking under the most intense of circumstances. But of course, in later years, George Lucas felt that the scene made Han look too callous, and for the 1997 special edition, he changed it to have Greedo fire a blaster at Han first, which he dodges before returning fire. This change really just makes Greedo look like a moron, while the original scene kept Greedo's own integrity intact whilst illustrating Han's strategic smarts. Palpatine's Order 66 in Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith As a galactic senator, Sheev Palpatine cultivated the persona of a politician with his people's best interests at heart. Little did anyone know that he was secretly reviving the Sith under the persona of Darth Sidious. As he claimed more and more political power, he performed atrocities behind the shadows, including putting hits on Queen Amidala, having Qui-Gon killed, and commissioning the construction of a moon-sized battle station. The reason why Palpatine's plan worked so well was because he knew when to act, and more importantly, when not to. When he was promoted to Supreme Chancellor, he didn't expose his true intentions. Even after he assembled a clone army, he didn't attack anyone publicly. Only after he turned Anakin to the dark side did he execute Order 66, forcing the clone troopers to instinctively hunt and wipe out all the Jedi. By the time Obi-Wan and Yoda learned Palpatine was the mastermind behind the Sith return, it was too late. He had too much power politically and physically. The Jedi were gone. It may have taken Palpatine years to initiate his plan fully, but it allowed him to rule the galaxy for decades. The Joker switches Rachel and Dent's locations, The Dark Knight. One of The Dark Knight's most iconic sequences, of which there are many, is the famous interrogation scene where Batman quizzes the Joker about the disappearance of both Rachel Dawes and Harvey Dent. And by quiz, I mean he practically beats the Joker to death. The Joker eventually explains that the two are hooked up with explosives in separate locations, and the Cape Crusader will need to choose which one to save. After learning the apparent locations from the Clown Prince of Crime, Batman heads off to save Rachel while Commissioner Gordon chases after Dent. But as it turns out, the Joker knew that Batman would pursue the object of his affection rather than Gotham's White Knight, and so pulled the old switcheroo, causing Batman to discover Dent instead. In straight-up trolling Batman, the Joker killed the love of his life and corrupted Gotham's greatest hope for a brighter future. He played Batman in a way that Batman could never really avenge without breaking his one rule. And that is bloody smart. Drinking the milk in Barbarian when people talk about how horror is absolutely thriving right now, last year's Barbarian is a prime example of why it's such a great time to be a horror hound these days. While it's one thing to deliver a spine-chilling trailer, it's something else entirely to follow through on that promise and deliver a spine-chilling final product. Thankfully, Barbarian did just that. Plot-wise, this Zack Kreger helmed offering initially centres on Tess and Keith, two strangers who have been double booked in the same Airbnb house. Given how Tess is the audience's in for the picture, there's a suspicion that maybe Keith isn't quite as pleasant as we're led to believe, even more so when Tess discovers a hidden room with a bloodstained mattress and a camcorder in it. The tease is that Keith is responsible for what's in this hidden room, and subsequently he's well aware of the underground tunnels that this leads to. Of course he's not, and the poor fella is brutally beaten to death by the deformed figure of mother. 
By the time Tess and the house's owner, AJ, wind up in the clutches of Mother later in the film, Tess has to disgustingly drink Mother's milk. By doing this, she unknowingly formed a bond with the creature, a bond that saw Mother save Tess in Barbarian's climax after AJ had pushed Tess to her likely death in order to save his own skin. Using the tunnels, praying to Busan. Whereas Snakes on a Plane was a schlocky gimmick that did exactly as it said on the tin, so too could Train to Busan have fallen into that trap with its premise of zombies on a train. Fortunately, Yon Sang Ho's South Korean zombie effort was far more than simply the sum of its parts, with this 2016 hit proving to be a modern day genre standout. In amongst its frenetic action and its sense of utter dread, Train to Busan also managed to serve up one particular moment of ingenious revelation. Completely obvious when you think about it, yet something that few zombie picture protagonists ever think about, Train to Busan's wannabe survivors had the penny drop moment that zombies aren't particularly useful when darkness comes a calling. It's Gong Yu's Seo Sok Wu who discovers this realization, with the undead becoming confused and redundant when the titular train enters a tunnel. And with tunnels on the horizon every two minutes, Seok Wu utilizes the weapon of darkness to strategically make his way across the train to help in his particular rescue mission. Making the most of technology, Halloween Resurrection. Halloween Resurrection regularly vies with Halloween The Curse of Michael Myers for the label of the worst offering to date in the Halloween franchise. Despite being a pretty damn awful movie, however, Resurrection does see some impressive smarts on the go from Bianca Kajlik's Sarah. Halloween Resurrection pulls inspiration from the ushering in of the Big Brother is Watching You era, and also clinging on to the found footage subgenre that had boomed post the Blair Witch Project. As such, the film opts to have cameras installed in the famed Myers house, and has a bunch of naive young adults spend the night there for a reality webcast. What could possibly go wrong, eh? Of course, Michael soon shows up to slash and slay his way through this fame-hungry group, but feisty heroine Sarah has the genius idea of using the tech at her fingertips to navigate her way to safety. Using the hottest technology that 2002 could offer up, Sarah messages back and forth with her online crush Deckard. With Deckard watching in on the action, he's able to let Sarah know where the shape is, where to hide, and when to make her break for freedom. These days, so many people are glued to their phones in an infuriating manner, but to be fair, opting to do just that saved her bacon in Halloween Resurrection. Now we just need to somehow erase those memories of Buster Rhymes pulling out kung fu moves to defeat poor Michael as part of Resurrection's climax. Uh. Frankenstein switches bodies in Revenge of Frankenstein. Throughout the Hammer series of Frankenstein, the authorities are constantly pursuing the titular scientist to put a stop to his barbaric and ungodly experiments. Because his ability to reanimate the dead is disregarded as pseudoscience, each film in the franchise revolves around Victor Frankenstein, trying to recreate his most famous experiment to prove his naysayers wrong. After living for over three years under the unsubtle pseudonym of Dr. Stein, Frankenstein is exposed and viciously attacked by the locals. When the police come to arrest him, they learn the deranged doctor has has died from his injuries. After inspecting his body, they confirm that Victor Frankenstein is finally dead. Or so it seems. Before he perished, Frankenstein had his assistant transfer his brain into a new body, which was then reanimated with the same technology that brought his original monster to life. Now that the authorities have closed the case on Frankenstein, the mad scientist is free from all persecution, allowing him to live freely in his new form. He's also satisfied that he evaded the authorities by performing the exact same experiment that all of society condemned him for. The secret genius behind the high ground, Revenge of the Sith. Although Revenge of the Sith is frequently regarded as the strongest of the Star Wars prequels, there's a general consensus that the conclusion to Anakin's duel with Obi-Wan on Mustafar ends a bit weirdly. As they reach the end of the lava reservoir, Kenobi jumps onto an embankment and urges Anakin not to try and duel him, as he has the high ground, a massive advantage for… reasons it's not really explained. The flaw here to most fans is that they'd seen Kenobi outduel Darth Maul and Naboo two films ago, even when the Sith Apprentice had the high ground, so what would it matter to the Chosen One if they attempted a similar feat? Well, that sort of answers the question in a way. Obi-Wan's plea to Anakin not to try it is a direct reference to his encounter with Maul in Episode 1, but whereas Maul was arrogant enough not to consider his opponent would attempt such a feat, Kenobi is way more prepared, and knew Anakin would try to replicate his heroics on Naboo. Learning from your mistakes, Scream 2. 
Like so many slashes of decades past, the first Scream movie finds Nev Campbell's Sydney Prescott positioned as the atypical final girl, who's thrust into a nightmare scenario that sees her stalked and tormented by a mysterious masked figure. Of course, part of the charm of Scream is how it flips the traditions of the slasher subgenre on its head, with Sydney's smarts coming to the fore in her final battle against Ghostface. In a movie that pokes fun at so many familiar horror tropes, the film's closing minutes deliver the age-old trick of the killer, Billy Loomis, not being dead. Startling our survivors, Billy rears up for one final scare, which is soon cut down by Sid shooting him in his forehead. Learning from this, Sydney takes no chances at the end of Scream 2. With Mrs. Loomis believed to be dead, Sydney unleashes an extra bullet into her head just to be safe. Whether Mrs. Loomis would have perked back up for another crazed attack, we'll never know. But in firing that extra shot into the fallen Loomis, Sydney smartly makes sure that Billy's mother is well and truly dead as a dodo. Obi-Wan mimics Qui-Gon stands to defeat more. Star Wars Rebels. Has there ever been a better rivalry in Star Wars? Kenobi, <coughs> I mean, Kenobi, was Maul's obsession for many years, but it would take years for him to catch up with his old rival following the conclusion of the Clone Wars. After seeing a vision of twin sons in a Sith holocron, Maul heads straight to Tatooine, determined to finally have his revenge. He eventually finds Obi-Wan and the two ignite their lightsabers. This is where things get ridiculously clever. In the scene, you can see Kenobi shift between a number of stances. First, he adopts his stance from the Clone Wars, Sarisu, before adopting his stance from a new cloak, and then to the one used by his old master, Qui-Gon. The intent is to use Maul's own arrogance against him. The former Sith Lord recognizes the stance and attempts the same move he used to kill Kenobi's master all those years ago, only this time, it goes terribly wrong. Obi-Wan parries Maul's attacks quickly and then slices at his saber straight down the middle as he attempts to repeat the stun that felled Qui-Gon, delivering a lethal blow that finally lays his old enemy to rest. It's brief, but beautiful, and a solid reminder of Kenobi's skill and cunning. Royal Pain hides her true identity, Sky High. And now for something a little more niche. We have the surprisingly entertaining 2005 movie, Sky High. And I know it's not an MCU or DC one, but I kind of tricked you at the beginning because that too was my master plan. In the third act, it's revealed that the movie's antagonist, Royal Payne, is actually Gwen Grayson, a beautiful and popular superhero attending Sky High. And it's a genuinely surprising reveal that has an unexpected amount of thought put into it. As it turns out, Royal Payne decided to assume the guise of an intensely stereotypical girl next door to charm protagonist Will Stronghold and, well, pretty much everyone else attending Sky High. This is all the result of a vendetta Gwen holds against Will's father, the commander, for a confrontation they had many years prior. And by by donning such a seemingly harmless persona, she manages to operate in Sky High undetected until making her big reveal. I mean, sure, she's ultimately foiled by the heroes, but by exploiting all of the students around her, she very nearly scores vengeance against the commander. Syndrome's Omnidroid in The Incredibles In The Incredibles, Syndrome plots to launch his destructive robot, the Omnidroid, onto a heavily populated city. After he swoops in to destroy it, it's assumed that society will perceive him as a superhero. In most comic-themed stories, the villain has some sort of doomsday device which the hero ultimately destroys after exploiting an obvious weakness. However, Syndrome is fully aware of this. He's been obsessed with superheroes since childhood and knows how resourceful they are at uncovering weaknesses in weapons and doomsday machines. In fact, Syndrome used this fact to his advantage. For years, he hired superheroes under the guise of a mysterious benefactor and asked them to destroy the Omnidroid, which had supposedly gone rogue on an island. If the superhero emerged triumphant, Syndrome rebuilt the robot so it was immune to the way it was defeated. If the Omnidroid won, then that was one less superhero for Syndrome to worry about. By the time the insidious supervillain believed he had killed every superhero on Earth, only then did he release the Omnidroid on the public, which by this point was nearly invincible. Although Syndrome was beaten by a baby, it was still a masterfully orchestrated stratagem. Galen Erso designs the Death Star's fatal flaw, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. By providing further context to the first Death Star's destruction, Rogue One transforms a much-joked-about plot point from A New Hope into something emotionally wrought that lays bare the odds the Rebellion was up against in sometimes terrifying detail. 
So a shout out, if you will, to Galen Erso, the former Imperial turned saboteur who purposely designed the Death Star's fatal flaw. Played by the ever wonderful Mads Mikkelsen, Galen was one of the principal architects of the Death Star who went into hiding. But after realizing the Empire would complete the weapon with or without him anyway, he understood that the best shot anyone had at destroying it would be if he undermined its construction from the inside. Without Galen's noble sacrifice, the Empire may have been able to build a truly impenetrable planet killer a hero of the Alliance, along with the rest of Rogue One. Cap pretends to be a Hydra agent. Avengers Endgame Captain America has always had the ability to think on his feet, and there's perhaps no better example of this than when he travels back to 2012 in Avengers Endgame. So here, Cap's mission is to acquire the Mind Stone from Stark Tower, where it's housed inside Loki's scepter. At this point, it's being transported by a corrupt shield unit that is actually working for Hydra. Things look like they're going to get all punch-happy when Cap catches up to them and orders them to hand it over. That is, until Cap leans over and whispers into Sitwell's ear the iconic words, Hail Hydra, ingeniously implying that even good old Captain America himself is a sleeper agent embedded within S.H.I.E.L.D. As such, Cap's able to avoid a second elevator fight and walks out safely with the scepter. That is, until he meets himself, but that's a different story. Counting to 12, World War Z. Amongst the so-so film, there are moments that genuinely impress, and one such moment is when Brad Pitt's Jerry makes a super smart decision that so many other characters in similar films would never dream of doing. As Jerry and his family make a dramatic run to rooftop safety, they have to navigate a stairwell brimming with infected, bloodthirsty friends. Upon making it to the roof, Jerry immediately runs to the edge of the building as he counts to 12. Why? That's because it takes 12 seconds for somebody to become infected, and Jerry somehow got zombie blood in his mouth. His logic here is that if he does show signs of infection, he can simply throw himself off the rooftop in order to keep his family safe during their helicopter rescue. Fortunately for Jerry and the rest of his family, the 12 seconds go by without any signs of infection rearing their head. I mean, which zombie would infect Brad Pitt? That is just a stupid decision to make. Reciting the General's wife's dying words, arrival. Denis Villeneuve's mind-melting sci-fi masterpiece follows linguist Louise Banks as she attempts to communicate with an alien race that has descended upon Earth. Banks eventually learns that the alien language will rewire the brain of anyone who learns it and alter their perception of time, allowing them to experience memories of events that, by traditional cognition, haven't happened yet, including the birth and untimely death of her own daughter. With China threatening an all-out war with the aliens if they don't leave Earth in 24 hours, Louise uses her new mastery of the language to perceive a future United Nations event, where China's General Shang thanks her for convincing him to call off the strike by reciting his dying wife's last words. In the present, having learned those words thanks to her newfound non-linear perception of time, she's able to do as Shang said she did, calling him and reciting those words, in war there are no winners, only widows. As presumably the ultimate proof of the gift the aliens have given humanity, assuming that nobody else was able to hear the general's words, this convinces him to call off the attack. A genius move in a genius movie. Ozymandias triggers his plan early. Watchmen. Though Zack Snyder's movie adaptation remains fiercely divisive amongst fans, the director absolutely nailed the stunning sequence where Ozymandias reveals to Rorschach and Night Owl 2 that his dastardly plot is to unite the United States and the USSR against a common enemy, in this case, Dr. Manhattan, by framing him for a spat of energy reactor explosions worldwide. Now, Rorschach and Night Owl plan to stop him, but he promptly tells them, I'm not a comic book villain. Do you seriously think I would explain my masterstroke to you if there was even the slightest possibility you could affect the outcome? I triggered it 35 minutes ago. Consequently, his plan goes off without a hitch. The energy reactors explode, killing millions. Manhattan is framed and forced to leave Earth forever, and humanity unites itself against him, and world peace is achieved. You can certainly question the morality of these actions, but the guy is known as the world's smartest man for a reason, and he proved so with his perfectly executed endgame. Learning from your mistakes, number two, Happy Death Day. From director Christopher Landon, 2017's Happy Death was a breath of fresh air for the horror genre. With Jessica Roth as Teresa Geldman, the picture centers on the absolute worst sort of Groundhog Day experience possible. A Groundhog Day where you're killed time and time again. Clever, humorous, and with a nice splash of gore, Happy Death Day found Roth's tree having to avoid history repeating itself each and every time she awakens. 
with Tree using her smarts to avoid dying in the same way as the previous day. Of course, the catch here is that a new death ultimately awaits Tree each day. Not to pinpoint one particular idea per se, but the smartest decision that Tree makes in Happy Death Day was to constantly learn from her mistakes. I'm not talking about Sydney Prescott unloading an extra bullet into someone's skull here, but more how Tree approaches each day with a fresh perspective, as she looks to implement a new plan of attack based on how she was killed the day prior. Eventually, all of these different roads and rationales led Tree to the light bulb moment where she finally realizes that it's her roommate Laurie who's been behind all of this trauma. Qui-Gon learns how to manifest after death. Revenge of the Sith. So, Qui-Gon Jinn. We've already talked about how he was one of the smartest Jedi of the prequels, given he was brave enough to defy the Council and had the foresight to see where they were headed, but there's another more obvious example of the late Jedi's intelligence in the films, his exploration of the living force and learning how to manifest after death. That one exchange in Revenge of the Sith, where Yoda informs Obi-Wan that he's been communing with Qui-Gon, takes Jin from being just another tragic figure in the Jedi Order to a character of even greater importance in the saga. Without Qui-Gon's spiritualism and his breakthrough in learning how to retain his being beyond the physical realm, Luke Skywalker would have been lost in his journey to defeat the dark side. Kenobi wouldn't have been able to sacrifice himself to ensure Luke's escape or provide further guidance in either episodes 5 or 6. Jin is instrumental to the Skywalker saga, but had he joined the Jedi Council and gotten absorbed in their politics, it's doubtful he would have been able to make such a pivotal breakthrough. Hiding in plain sight in more ways than one in Inside Man. Inside Man opens with a criminal called Dalton Russell claiming he pulled off the perfect bank robbery. Now every facet of Russell's plan is meticulously thought out. Forcing the hostages in the bank to dress the same way as the robbers so the police can't tell them apart is genius. He also sends recordings of Albanian chatter through the police radio waves so the detective on the case will waste hours to translate and decipher the messages unaware it has absolutely nothing to do with the robbery. But the masterstroke is the finale. Once the police have the bank surrounded, it looks like Russell is done. Instead of trying to escape, Russell takes a bag of priceless diamonds and seals himself inside the supply room behind a fake wall. One week later, he exits through the fake wall and walks out the front door. What makes Russell's success all the more satisfying is the fact that he bumps into the detective just before he leaves the bank. That detective was in the presence of the man he was assigned to arrest and he just let him walk out, oblivious of his true identity. Handing a grenade to the doppelganger, Annihilation. Annihilation is one hell of a sci-fi head trip and concludes with soldier Lena reaching the Shimmer, the source of the extraterrestrial anomaly that has been causing grotesque mutations to the surrounding area. Inside the nearby lighthouse, she witnesses Dr. Ventress transform into a nebulous object, which after taking a drop of Lena's blood, mutates into a metallic doppelganger of her. As Lena attempts to escape the lighthouse, the doppelganger mimics her movements in an attempt to stop her escaping, even nearly suffocating her against the wall. But but Lena has one very clever idea. With seemingly no way to fend off the doppelganger, she decides to grab a phosphorus grenade and hand it to the clone, which, by copying her movements, it gratefully accepts. Lena then flees at the very last minute, while the doppelganger is left to burn with what remains of the Shimmer. Talk about cleverly improvising a solution to a situation that could have easily resulted in her death. 